many, many weeks, and I thank God that the time has come. The Lord blessed us very much on the campus of Spicer Memorial College, and I just left there earlier today, and I look forward very much to God blessing us through his word as we deliver that word from night to night and morning to morning uh, during this week of special spiritual emphasis. So thank you very much for granting me the special, special honor of being with you here at Salisbury Memorial uh, English Church. And I know that God will bless us and I hope you will try to come every night and don't just come, but bring someone with you. Maybe a relative or a friend who needs to hear the word of God because the word of God has the power to change lives in miraculous ways. So come and bring someone with you and God will do wonderful things in our lives during the week. It is now almost 20 to eight and I want to release you early. I know you have things to do tomorrow, but before I pray, I want you to do three things for me. Number one, if you have a cell phone, I want you to turn it off, not down, off. Two, while I'm speaking, pray for me. And what I want you to say is this, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. God's words have power. My words have no power. And so I want to speak God's words, not mine. I want to give God's truth, not my opinion. So pray and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. And the third thing I want you to do, I want you to think of what you're hearing. As you think, the Spirit of God will bless your mind. It is the capacity to think that separates us from the animals. So please, as you listen to God's Word, I want you to think. Our subject for tonight, by every word. What did I say? By every word. How many of you have Bibles with you? May I see them? All right, raise them high, raise them high. Okay, all right, okay. Thank you very much. Let's bow our heads now and pray. Father in heaven, we bow in your presence as your children. We thank you today, God, you spared our lives today and brought us to this house of prayer, this house of worship, to listen to your word, and to fellowship one with another. Holy Father, bless us with your presence. Grant us your spirit that he may guide our minds into truth. Speak through me, dear God. I humble myself before you. I seek no glory for myself, but I seek to direct all the glory to your name. Please make the words simple and clear that everyone of every age may understand. Bless this service. If, if there are those who are still on their way, bring them safely, dear God. I offer this prayer from my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. By every word. Genesis chapter 1, we shall begin reading at verse 1. Genesis chapter 1, reading from verse 1. And I'm reading from the King James Version of the Bible. Genesis 1, reading from verse 1. The Bible says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let me repeat that, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. 
And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. Now, we can go through all six days of creation. And there's something that happens on every day. And it is this. And God said, Let there be light. Let there be a firmament. Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together unto one place. Verse 11. Let the earth bring forth grass. Verse 14. Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Verse 20, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. Verse 24, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. Over and over we read these three words, and God said. And whatever God said is what happened. Think with me. I want you to put your mind back, way back, when God was creating. I want you to stand somewhere on a big rock in space and you are watching God. It's all darkness. All you hear is, let there be light. Four words. That's all you hear. And suddenly, the light comes. That tells us several things. God's word has power. My words have no power. Let me explain what I mean. You have a wallet. Take your wallet in your hand. Go on, take your wallet in your hand. No one will steal it. Take your wallet in your hand. We will see if our word has power. You have your wallet, just raise it up a little bit, or your purse, anything in which you put your money, just hold it up. Now here's what I want you to say with me, let there be a million rupees in my wallet. Now you can say that all night. Now look into your wallet and see if you find a million rupees. And the answer is no. You know why? Because your word and my word have no power. Now if God were to say, let there be a million rupees in your wallet, there would be a million rupees immediately. Why? Because when God's word says something, it happens. How do we know that? The very first chapter of the Bible, the third verse, and God said, let there be light. And what happened? There was light. This is a lesson that God is teaching us in the very first chapter of the Bible. His word is powerful. And for God's word to work, it does not need raw materials. Here's what I mean. To build this church, you need raw materials. You need wood, you need brick, you need straw, you need water, you need cement, you need a lot of things to build a building, not God. God makes things out of nothing. And how does he do it? Through his word. Now, you and I need to understand that because sometimes we will find ourselves in situations in this life that look impossible as if there is no way out, there is no hope. But when that happens to us, we remember we serve a God whose word is powerful and can bring something out of nothing. And so the Bible says, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. God's word is powerful. A second lesson about God's word. God's word does exactly what it says. I may say to you, I am coming to your house tomorrow at 8 o'clock in the morning. Because of traffic, I may get there at 8.30. 
or 845 or 9. I said 8, but I arrived at 830 because of circumstances. I cannot control the traffic. I had a flat tire. I ran out of gas. There is no circumstance that can prevent God's word from fulfilling what it says. Let me say that again. If God says, let there be light, there is nothing in the universe that will prevent the light from coming. Nothing. That is why God cannot lie. Go with me to Numbers chapter 23. Let's read verse 19 as we continue with the subject by every word. Numbers is book number four. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Chapter 23, reading verse 19. It's always a pleasure to hear the pages of the Bible being turned in the church. Do you have Numbers chapter 23, verse 19? The Bible says, God is not a man that he should lie. Let me see if you're thinking. Listen to the words again. When you read the Bible, you must also look for what the Bible does not say in words. Listen to the Bible. God is not a man that he should lie. What is the Bible saying about men? That they lie. Now, it's not written out. Are you following me? But that's the message. Men lie. Women lie. The Bible says, not God. God does not lie, and God cannot lie. And the reason God cannot lie is because his word is so powerful, whatever the word says happens. Let me give you an example of what I mean when I say God cannot lie. Not when I say it, when the Bible says it. Christmas is coming in December. You have little sons, you have little daughters. Maybe you will promise your son to buy him a bicycle. And you say to your little boy, David or Sachin, if he can bat like Tendulkar, you say, Sachin, I will buy you a bicycle for Christmas. Now he's five years old. He does not care about the economy. That's not his business. That's your business, not his. You said, I will buy you a bicycle for Christmas. That's all that's on Sachin's mind every day as he checks the calendar to see how close he is to December 25. Now, in August, you lose your job. In September, your wife needs a very expensive operation. And in October, your oldest boy needs school fees. When December comes, you do not have the money for the bicycle. So you have to talk to your little boy, Brother Sachin, and you say, Sachin, I want to talk to you. Have a seat. I cannot get you the bicycle. And he's disappointed. He does not understand why his father would say, I will get you a bicycle, and then say, I cannot get you the bicycle. What Sachin does not understand, that when the father spoke, he spoke from a genuine heart. He meant what he said, but he could not control the fact that he lost his job. He could not control the fact that his wife became ill. He could not control the fact that his eldest boy needed school fees. And so circumstances occurred that prevented him from keeping his word to that degree he lied there are two ways to lie one is to deliberately twist the truth that's one way to lie that's how most of us lie come on say amen <laughs> but God forgives the other way to lie is to say something and then find that you are not able to do what you said. That is also a lie, but it is not a moral lie. 
because you really meant what you said. Now, the Bible says God is not a man that he should lie. Anytime, if God says to you, I will get you a bicycle, if God says, I will forgive your sins, he will forgive your sins because he cannot lie. Because his word always does what the word says. So when God says in 1 John chapter 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the word. When you confess that sin, you must believe that you are forgiven because Genesis 1-3, which says, and God said, let there be light, it teaches us that whatever God says is exactly what happens. So if God says, I will forgive you, when you say, I am sorry, you must believe you are forgiven because God cannot lie. And to doubt you are forgiven is to doubt God's word. And the greatest insult we can do to God is to doubt his word. Let me put it this way. By every word is our subject. The Bible does not begin with the cross of Christ. It does not begin with the birth of Christ. It begins with a demonstration of the power of God's Word. That's what Genesis 1 is. A demonstration of the power of God's Word. Those of you who have applied for jobs, you are always asked to submit, what do you call it in India, a resume? A resume. And you fix up your resume, you stretch your qualifications you're working at McDonald's and you give it a fancy title so you sound like some expert manager you see you're a janitor and you call yourself a sanitation engineer <laughs> so that you can get that job that's what people do on resumes if you believe everything on a resume everyone would be a saint and an expert and so we submit our resumes now God is saying to us in Genesis chapter 1, I am applying for the position of your Savior and your God. But before you decide to hire me, read my resume. Here is what I can do. I can type, says God, but I don't use my fingers. I just speak and the words come on the paper. I can do whatever you need without lifting a finger, says God. I just speak. And whatever you need happens. And God says, look at my resume. I created the sun. I just spoke. I created light. I just spoke. Then God says, can you hire a God with these abilities? Is there any other God anywhere whose word is so powerful? And God said, and God said, and God said. In Matthew chapter 8, let's go there. Let's run over to the New Testament, Matthew 8. And while you're looking for Matthew 8, let me welcome those who are watching us by tape or recording, DVD, CD, whatever technological avenue you're using to come into contact with this message. We're delighted you're with us, and may God bless you through this message. Matthew 8, reading from verse 5. What was Matthew before he met Jesus? A tax collector, but tax collectors were really what? Thieves. They would steal because they would take more than they were required to take, give the Romans what was due to the Romans, and keep the rest. The Jews hated tax collectors. Zacchaeus was one of them. But when Matthew met Jesus, his life was changed to such a degree, he went from being a thief to the first writer of the New Testament. If you are a thief listening to me tonight, 
If you will allow Jesus to touch you, he will change your life. Can you say amen? What he did for Matthew, he can do for you. Matthew 8, reading from verse 5, the Bible says, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, they came unto him, a centurion, beseeching him, and saying unto him, Master or Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, and grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. Let me pause on that. This is an offer from Christ. I will come and heal him. If Jesus walked into your town, to your, to your street, and he said to you, I want to come to your house, what would you say? I would say, yes, Lord. Just give me five minutes to go and dust and sweep before you come. Jesus says, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof. But speak the word. What's the next word after that? Only. And my servant shall be healed. I don't know if you understand what the centurion was saying. I'm not sure the centurion understood exactly what he said. What the centurion was saying is that if Jesus had come personally, whatever he would have done, if he had come personally, the word can do. So it was not necessary for Jesus to come personally. He just had to send the word. And anything Jesus can do personally, the word can do. Now this is a very serious teaching because Jesus Christ right now is in heaven. Follow me closely. He's in heaven. When a preacher tells you, receive Jesus into your heart, Christ cannot come into your heart because he is still flesh and blood right now. He is also God, but he's God and man. He still has both conditions. And so the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, there's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, the man. And Paul wrote that about 20 years after Jesus went back to heaven. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, Paul writes, In him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus Christ still has human form. That's how he came from the grave. Because of that, he cannot enter into us. But the Bible says we must have Jesus. Now, I wonder how many of you are following where I am going. The centurion said, you don't have to come physically. Hmm? Your word will do whatever you would do. Because whatever power you have, your word has. What this means for us is that we have, we receive Jesus Christ when we do what? When we receive his word. Ah, some of you missed it. It's my fault. Let me try again. When the centurion told Jesus Christ, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy and grievously tormented, what did Jesus offer to do? He said, I will come and heal him. The centurion said, you don't have to come. Send your word. Jesus does not have to leave heaven and come and get into you somehow. He enters us how? Through his word. So when you read the word of God and you accept the word of God and you obey the word of God, the power in the word works in your life. It is the power of Christ. That is why when you reject God's word, what are you doing? You're rejecting God. 
When you doubt the word, you doubt God. A God who said, let there be light, and there was light. My brothers and my sisters, God does everything through his word. How did God create? Psalm 33, reading from verse 6, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. God created by his word. Hebrews 11, verse 3, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old. Creation was done by the word. So God creates by the word, but how does God maintain creation? By the same word. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. God creates by the word. He maintains creation by the word. How does God sanctify us? John 17, verse 17, sanctify them, how? Through thy truth, thy word is truth. He sanctifies through the word. How does God save? Through the word. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. James 1, verse 18, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. My brothers and sisters, God creates by his word. He preserves creation by his word. He saves by his word. He sanctifies by his word. Listen to Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. And when the evil was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word. By the way, if you can't sleep at night because you're troubled by spirits, take the word of God before you go to bed and read it. Take some time to meditate on it. Here's what I mean. You take a verse like 1 John chapter 3 verse 8 which says, he that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. You read that verse and you say, Father, that verse says Jesus destroys what Satan does. Destroy what Satan has been doing every night in my life. Let me sleep. You read that, you read it, you think about it, meditate on it, fall asleep thinking of that verse, you will sleep. I was preaching in a certain country on the African continent. This young lady came to me. She said, Pastor, I cannot sleep. Every night spirits come and disturb me. She was about 16 or 17. I said, all right, sister, here are some Bible verses. I gave her Revelation 12, verse 7 to verse 9. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was the place found anymore in heaven. Verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out. And I told her, the same God that cast the dragon out of heaven can cast him out of your mind at night. I gave her Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. I told her God has the power to destroy Satan in your life. Take those verses, read them, think about them, Believe them and fall asleep thinking. She came back to me the next day. And God is my witness. The next day, she said, Pastor, I slept for the first time in months. Amen. 
Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3 thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee the way your mind rests on God is by resting on God's word and so I say to you again Genesis chapter 1 verse 3 and God said that's all he did and the power of God is in his word listen to me carefully the power of God is in his word the life of God is in his word the character of God is in his word and the Spirit of God is in his word in John chapter 6 verse 63 listen to what Jesus says about the word he says it is the spirit that quickeneth what does quickeneth mean give life god bless whoever answered correctly it quickeneth means to give life jesus says it is the spirit that quickeneth the flesh profiteth nothing the words that i speak unto you they are spirit and they are life now you must ask yourself what life not the life the pharisees were living that's just physical life the word of god is more than that the word of god is spiritual life ellen white writes desire of ages page 390 paragraph 3 the life of christ that gives life to the world is in the word come on more people say amen, amen. the life of christ which gives life to the world is in the word Let me tell you a secret about the devil. The devil does not try to get most people to commit murder and genocide and blow up buildings and blow up cars. No. Very few people do these things. You know what the devil does successfully? He keeps us so busy, we have no time for the source of life. I don't know this is the first time we're meeting like this and I thank God for the sweet privilege but I would guess most Christians do not study the Bible we are busy with our studies we are busy with our romantic relationships we are busy moving up the ladder of our chosen career. We are busy raising children. We are busy doing everything under the sun. And so we have no time for the source of life, the source of wisdom, the source of power, the very means by which Christ dwells in us. We have no time. Yet we call ourselves Christians. The words that I speak unto you, says Christ, they are spirit and they are life. God's word is power to create, to save, to sanctify. If you have children who are behaving badly and they're still under your roof, the most effective way to change that child is the word of God. Go to Psalm 119, let's read verse 9. Psalm 119, verse 9. It's a familiar verse. 119, verse 9. We're talking about what is an effective way to change the heart of your child, your rebellious child. The Bible gives the answer. The Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 9, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways? Put it in modern English. How can young man behave properly the verse ends by saying by taking heed thereto according to thy word you see the word of God is also a detergent you understand what I mean by detergent what's your favorite washing powder in Pune what's it called tide okay the word of God is tied are you with me when you put Tide in the water, what does Tide do? It removes the dirt. 
Listen to Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. It is by the word that God washes us and removes the stains of bad habits. The word of God is tied. Do you have Clorox in Pune? What do you use it, along with Tide to remove difficult stains? What do you use? Who? What? Vanish. Vanish. Oh, the word of God is vanish. Because when you receive the word of God into your heart, eventually the bad habits do what? They vanish. Because God's word has cleansing power, it has creative power, it has sustaining power, it has sanctifying power, it has healing power, it has vanishing power. In other words, everything you need is in God's word. Many people don't know how to go in life. Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I go this way, that way? What decision should I make? The Bible says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If you and I will study God's word faithfully, God will direct us in every area of life. What work should I do? Where should I live? Whom should I marry? Because God loves to guide his people and he guides them through the word. And so my brothers and sisters, our subject for tonight, by every word. Matthew chapter 4, reading from verse 1, possibly our final Bible reference for tonight. It's 8.15. Matthew 4, reading from verse 1. A familiar passage. Have you found Matthew 4? We were in Matthew 8. The Bible says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward unhungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Verse 4 says, But he answered and said, It is written, the word again, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now listen to the words again. Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Now Jesus, when he said man, he meant mankind. He also included himself because he was a man. What Christ was saying, this is the way I live by every word. Because when he said that, he was in the wilderness. It was only he and Satan. What Christ was saying, I live by every word. My friends, if Jesus in his humanity on this earth lived by the word of his Father, should we live any differently? No. The second temptation, the devil taketh him up into the city and set of him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hand they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. What does Jesus say to him? It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. The devil changed his temptations. Jesus never changed his response. It is written. That's how we should live, by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Let me ask you this question, but do not answer me. Do you live by the word of God? Or do you live by what people say? Or by what people expect? Do you know how much we are terrorized by what other people expect? instead of by what God wants. 
Listen to me, in the judgment, it is not people who decide if you go to heaven or hell, it is God. Amen. Are you with me? Let us live by what God says, not by what people expect. So someone expects me to have a house that has 10 rooms, and so I go and I get a big loan, put myself in debt to get a house with 10 rooms because people expect. Well, I work for a bank, so they expect me to drive a Mercedes, so I go get a second mortgage to buy a Mercedes because people expect. What God expects, he expects me to live by this. Let me close it to let you know I'm closing. But Jesus answered and said, Matthew chapter 4 verse 4, it is written. In other words, the word. Here's a second question for you. Don't answer me. Whatever you're doing in your life, is it written? That boyfriend you have, is it written? That woman you're seeing, is it written? That plan you want to follow to make more money, is it written? If it's not written, don't do it. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. But to know how to live by the word, we must study the word. Having studied the word, we must obey the word. Christ Object Lessons, page 100, paragraph 1, Ella White writes, if studied and obeyed. Two things. Studied, what's the other thing? Obeyed. The Word of God works in the heart, subduing every unholy impulse or attribute. If studied and obeyed, the Word of God works in the heart, subduing. What do you understand by subduing? Controlling, thank you my handsome brother, controlling every unholy attribute. Do you have unholy attributes? Do I have them? Do we have desires that are wrong? That's an unholy attribute. The word of God in the heart will control it. The word will choke it until it dies. Evangelism, page 138, paragraph 4. We read these powerful words. The word of God is our sanctification and righteousness because it is spiritual food. Listen to how the quotation ends. To study it is to eat the leaves of the tree of life. <laughs> yes, hallelujah, I like that. To study this is the same thing as eating the leaves of the tree of life because the life in that tree is in this world but it must be studied and obeyed. I want you to make this commitment tonight. If there's some area of God's word which you know, but you do not follow, make a commitment tonight to obey God's word. My brothers and sisters, we hurt ourselves by ignoring God's word. We hurt ourselves. Let me repeat the commitment I want us to make. If there are aspects, requirements in God's word which we know but we do not honor and fulfill tonight by the grace of God, let us say, Father, help me to honor and live by your word. Because your word is life. Your word is power. Your word is forgiveness. Your word is cleansing. Your word is protection. Your word is health. The word is health. Let me say something about that. When you make a decision to obey God, your health begins to improve. Mind, character, and personality, book one, page 34, paragraph three, Ella White writes these words. Let the mind become intelligent, and the will be placed on the Lord's side, and there will be a wonderful improvement in the physical health. Mm-hmm. 
A decision to obey God, a genuine decision, brings about physical benefits without swallowing one tablet. Now, you're all intelligent people. Having heard all that I had to say, you should run off and buy two more Bibles. So you have a lot of them. Study. Obey. Study it. Obey it. Obedience is life. Disobedience is slow death. Let me say it again. Obedience is life. Listen to the Apostle Paul, Romans 6, 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants ye are, to whom ye obey, whether of obedience unto life, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto life or righteousness. Obedience is life. Obedience is the means by which the power of God's word is released. And so tonight I recommit myself to living by every word that proceeds out of God's mouth. Now, you and I do not know every word, so we have to live by every word that we know. Are you with me? That we know. But our prayer must be, Lord, open thou mine eyes, that I may learn and learn and learn. Never be satisfied with ignorance. Open thou mine eyes. That's what David prayed in Psalm 119, verse 18. Open my eyes. This must be our prayer. Because the more we know and the more we live by what we know, the closer we become with God. Now, how many of you will say, Father, help me to study your word, obey it, and live by it? Can I see your right hand? Help me to study your word, obey it, and live by it. Stand up with me. Who needs special prayer? Special prayer for anything. You need special prayer. All right, hands down. Who needs prayer for sickness? You are sick. Anyone needs prayer for you are sick? Let me see your hands. All right, there's prayer for sickness. Okay, hands down. Who needs prayer for family members who do not yet know the truth? Can I see your right hand? Okay, all right, hands down. Who needs prayer for exams they're about to take? Can I see your right hand? Okay, hands down. Who needs prayer because you're considering a relationship with a man or a woman, you're not quite sure, but you need God's guidance? Can I see your right hand? Okay, all right. Who needs prayer for a job because you're not employed? You need prayer for a job. Can I see your right hand? God bless you. Okay, heads bowed, eyes closed. Father in heaven, we thank you today, God, for your word. Your word says in Genesis 1, 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Father, you can say in our lives, let there be health, and there will be health. Let there be a husband, there will be a husband or a wife. Let there be a child as you did for Sarah and Abraham, and there will be a child. Let there be success on the exam, and there will be success. Father, your word has not lost its power, because the power of your word is your life itself. Now, loving Father, as we bow in your presence, having heard the message about your word, first we ask you to forgive us for not taking your word more seriously. Forgive us for allowing all the cares of this life to distract us from the study of your word. Dear God in heaven, help us, having heard about the word, having been reminded about the importance of the word, help us, dear God, to make time as a matter of life and death to study your word and obey it that the power of the word may be released into our lives. Father, your children raise their hands to say they have requests in the area of employment, exams, romance, family members outside of the church, sickness, any other area where they have need. In the name of Jesus, who lived as a human being, who understands our sorrows and our hurts and our desires, who is still human now, in his name, dear God, Bless us in the areas of our needs. 
If there's anything we're doing to offend you, show that to us, Father, and we will confess it and put it away. Please, God, touch us in the areas of our need. Please do that. Now take us home safely. Grant us a pleasant night's rest. Bring us back tomorrow, Father, to hear your word again. Thank you, Father, for Genesis chapter 1. And God said, and God said, thank you for your powerful word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let all God's people say, Amen and Amen. God bless you. Travel safely. Come back tomorrow and try to bring someone with you. A friend, a relative, an enemy. Bring somebody with you tomorrow.